evening, everyone. I am Liza Bernard from the Norwich Bookstore, but obviously zooming in from home. And along with Marco Stafney, who is the executive director of the Montchamp Museum, we welcome you to this launch day. This is the day that the um, book is officially launched. Uh, Jerry DeSilva's new book, First Steps, How Upright Walking Made Us Human. And it's a fascinating story. But before we begin, a little bit of housekeeping. As Marco said, for those of you who signed on early, this is a Zoom webinar. You are all not visible and not, we can't hear you, we can't see you, but you can enter your questions in the chat bar and Marcos will be feeding them to um, Jerry as we go along. And um, the format tonight is gonna be pretty straightforward. Um, Marcos will do an introduction of our guest and then there'll be a presentation. They'll discuss the book. Your questions will be uh, passed on and hopefully answered. And um, we are being recorded. So if you know somebody who couldn't join us tonight, they'll be able to catch up on the talk later on. So without further ado, the stage is yours, Marcos. Thank you so much, Liza. And we couldn't be happier to partner with our good neighbor, the Norwich Bookstore um, this evening with the Montchari Museum of Science. And this is a trifecta of having Jerry De Silva here this evening. Jerry also serves as a Montchari trustee because he cares about science that much. And we're really happy to launch his book this evening. Um, I'm gonna give a quick author introduction and a little bit of an overview for the book and then launch into the featured presentation with Jerry today. Jeremy, Jerry De Silva, as an associate professor of anthropology at Dartmouth College. He's a paleoanthropologist specializing in the locomotion of the first apes or homino hominoids and early human ancestors, hominins. His particular anatomical expertise, the human foot and ankle, has contributed to our understanding of the origins and evolution of upright walking in the human lineage. He has studied wild chimpanzees in Western Uganda and early human fossils at sites throughout Eastern and South Africa. From 1998 to 2003, Jerry worked as an educator at the Boston Museum of Science, School Museum Education, and continues to be a passion, continues to be passionate about science education. He's a member of the Board of Trustees for the Montreal Museum of Science, and he lives in Norwich, Vermont, with his wife, Erin, and their two kids, Ben and Josie. We're really happy to welcome him today with this amazing book, First Steps, which explores the unusual and extraordinary nature of walking on two legs, but he'll tell you more about that himself. Ladies and gentlemen, Jerry De Silva. Go for it, Jerry. Thank you so much, Marcos. Um, I'm gonna share my screen. Um, how are we looking? Looking great, Jerry. Fabulous. Okay. So good evening, everyone. Um, I'd like to start by, by thanking uh, Lisa Bernard, uh, the Norwich Bookstore, and the Machar Museum of Science, and, and Marcos uh, for entertaining us at the beginning there, uh, and for that really <laughs> wonderful introduction. Um, it is fitting for me that uh, a book launch for First Steps is being hosted by a science museum. More than 20 years ago, I rediscovered my love for science. Uh, I found my own science of paleoanthropology, um, and I met my wife, Erin, uh, when I worked as an educator at the Boston Museum of Science. So science museums, for me, are, are really special places. They inspire people to wonder about their world, to ask the big questions, and to make informed, evidence-based decisions. But because of necessary COVID shutdowns in the last year, science museums around the country are really struggling. So if you can, um, please consider giving to your local science museum. And this is also somewhat bittersweet for me. Um, as some of you may know, Marcos Stephanie, our voice for science here in the Upper Valley for the last six years, will be moving on from his position as the executive director at the Montshire at the end of the month. Marcos, I just wanna say while I have the, the floor, um, you have inspired so many people with your passion for museum education and for continuing to make the Montshire a vital part of our community. So thank you so much for all you've done and all you continue to do for uh, science into the future. I'm so glad that we're going to have this this final event together. So let's face it, humans are weird. Although we are mammals, we have very little body hair. We have exceptionally large brains for our body size and have developed complex cultures. While other animals communicate, we talk. Many animals pant, but we sweat. And perhaps oddest of all, humans navigate the world on two rather than four legs. We are bipedal. 
For the next 15 or 20 minutes or so, I'll cover some of the material that's in my new book, First Steps, which examines the evolutionary history of bipedal walking, explores how this form of locomotion was the gateway for many of the changes that made us human. And I'll dive into why this should still matter to us today. DNA studies indicate that humans are most closely related to chimpanzees and bonobos. Now, this doesn't mean we evolved from them. They are our cousins. Our lineage and theirs diverged from a common ancestor, which lived about six million years ago. Now, how long ago is that? Assuming that a new generation appears every 25 years or so, the last common ancestor that I share with, with this chimpanzee was my great, 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 great grandmother with about 240,000 greats in front of grandmother. If I said great once a second, it would take me three full days without a break to reach the point where my lineage diverged from a chimpanzee. Now, let's do some science. If this was true, if humans share a common ancestor with chimpanzees, then we should find fossils of things that are neither human nor ape, but had some characteristics of both in African sediments going back 6 million years or so. Some folks call these missing links, but they aren't missing. We literally have thousands of ancient human fossils, and we call these hominins. Shown here are some of the most famous ones. Think of them as the greatest hits. For instance, with my cursor here, here's Lucy, as many of you may know. Every fossil we have, whether it's a partial skeleton or even a fragment of a shin bone, each one of these fossils tells an important story about us. These bones are all that remain of breathing, thinking beings who laughed, cried, lived, and died. They help us piece together how we became human. Now, the general framework of human evolution is pretty well established, but it's complicated. And new fossils are constantly forcing us to reassess old ideas. That's how science works. But at the very beginning of our story, six, seven million years ago, long before evidence for stone tools or controlled fire, before our brains enlarged, before language or art, our ancestors evolved the ability to walk on just two legs. What got us going? on this remarkable human journey was the way we move. Now, how do we know this? The very oldest fossils in the human lineage recovered from sediments in Africa, in Chad, Kenya, and Ethiopia, preserve anatomies that are consistent with upright walking. Now, we'll come back to the fossils in a bit, but for now, just understand that walking on two legs is an ancient defining characteristic of our lineage. But from an evolutionary perspective, it's also really odd. There are mammals out there that fly, swim, cling and leap, mammals that swing, sprint, knuckle walk and climb. There are also some mammals that hop and those are bipeds too, but what I'm focusing on today are the ones that stride one leg at a time like us. And then most mammals do what this cow does, right? They just move around on all fours, similar to a goat, sheep, horse, cow, dog, cat or squirrel. That's the traditional way to move if you're a mammal, but not us. We move on our extended hind limbs, and that's a strange way for a mammal to get around. Here's how strange. In a lifetime, the average non-disabled person will take about 150 million steps, enough to circle the earth three times without thinking much about it. If I posted a video of myself walking across the Dartmouth campus green, I can't imagine many people would find it interesting enough to watch. But well, watch this. This YouTube video of a bipedal bear named Petals moving on two legs through a New Jersey suburb has been viewed almost 5 million times. Videos of Petals ended up on the CBS Morning News. When, hum when humans walk, it's, well, it's pedestrian. When another mammal moves on two legs, it's newsworthy. Bipedalism has made its way into our words, expressions, and entertainment. Think of the many ways we describe walking. We applaud and traipse and amble and saunter. We shuffle, tiptoe, lumber, tromp, lope, strut, and swagger. After walking all over someone, we might be asked to walk a mile in their shoes. Heroes walk on water while geniuses are walking encyclopedias. To humanize an animated character like Winnie the Pooh or Brian the Dog from Family Guy, they're drawn as bipeds. And think of the joy we experience watching a child's first steps. The Dutch master Vincent van Gogh captured such a scene in 1889. And a quarter 
and a century later, my own son, Benjamin, took his first steps. And once kids start walking, they don't stop. I visited Karen Adolph's developmental psychology lab at New York University, and there a toddler followed this blue path in just 10 minutes. In fact, the average toddler takes 2,368 steps, the length of eight football fields, every hour. That's how they learn to walk. As Adolph writes, thousands of steps and dozens of falls per day. But bipedalism is a lot more than getting from point A to point B. It's a form of communication and identification. My wife, Erin, and I both work at, at Dartmouth. And pre-pandemic, I would occasionally spot her striding across the campus green. And I knew it was her just from her walk, even when I'm too far away to see her face. And from the cadence and posture, I, I, can, tell if, uh, I can tell if she's in a good mood or, or has had a tough day. Each of us has our own unique gait, and humans are particularly fine-tuned to identify individuals from their walk. Why? Well, gait and posture cues might have been a critical means of communication in our pre-verbal ancestors. And not only that, but there are physical and mental benefits to walking. A 2012 study done by the National Cancer Institute on 650,000 people found that individuals who did the exercise equivalent of a 25-minute daily walk lived on average four years longer than the more sedentary counterparts. A daily walk has been shown to improve memory and creativity. It helps ward off certain cancers, diabetes, stroke, and cardiovascular disease. But this isn't magic. The physiological mechanism is being worked out, starting by uh, uh, some really extraordinary work done by Dana Danish physiologist Bente Klarlung Peterson. She and her team discovered that your muscles act as endocrine organs and release molecules called myokines into the bloodstream when they contract. These myokines target organs throughout the body, helping maintain health. And it's not that walking is some cure all. As someone who studies human evolution, I see this somewhat differently. Walking is our default. Humans have always walked. Throughout our history, if we wanted to eat, we had to walk. What's new is not walking. And that immobility has had a huge impact on our collective health. I recognize, however, that this can be complicated. Having the opportunity to take a walk safely and without harassment or worse is a privilege not afforded to everyone as long as racism and sexism persist in our society. But taking a walk and the biological ability to do so is important and it always has been. In first steps, I make the case that upright walking set in motion all of the major evolutionary events in the human lineage, from dietary changes and freeing the hands to create and use tools, to cooperative parenting, brain enlargement, language, and the development of trade networks, eventually allowing us a once humble ape standing in the ancient Miocene forests to populate the globe. Despite this though, we still aren't sure why upright walking evolved at all. There are hypotheses about bipedalism evolving to carry food or to carry babies. Some researchers have posited that upright walking was en energetically beneficial to our ancestors. There are ideas that uprightness helped our ancestors see over tall grass, pick low hanging fruit or wade through water. And of course, there's the ever persist persistent but incorrect idea that ancient hominins stood on two legs to wield weapons. The so-called killer ape hypothesis made famous in Stanley Kubrick's science fiction thriller 2001, A Space Odyssey. Now, I'm sure you're all familiar with this image, or this one, or this one. This sequence is called The March of Progress. And it appears on t-shirts and coffee cups and bumper stickers. And it assumes what most people think, that upright walking hominins, early ones, were hunched over, having evolved from a chimpanzee-like knuckle walking ancestor. But the latest fossils we're finding indicate that this may not be right. In fact, we aren't even sure right now the body form from which upright walking first evolved. Some researchers have proposed that instead of bipedalism evolving from the ground up, it happened from the trees down, from the top down, from an ape standing or swinging up in the trees. Now, to test these ideas, we need fossils, ideally partial skeletons from five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten million years ago. Those, however, are yet for the most part to be discovered. 
What we have instead are tantalizing fragments, a skull here, a femur there, a toe bone. But in paleoanthropology, you work with what you have. So what do we have? Well, the most relevant partial skeletons to address this question have been announced to the world in just the last decade or so. They are Artipithecus ramidus, or arty, a four and a half million year old hominin from Ethiopia, first published in 2009, and Udu, from a species called Denuvius guggenmosi, which was discovered in 2019 by Madeleine Burma. Udu was found in Germany and is 11 and a half million years old. And yes, you heard that right, Germany. 11 and a half million years ago, there were vast forests around the Mediterranean, and ancient apes once lived in Southern Europe. We find their fossils in Spain, France, Italy, Greece, Turkey, Hungary, and Germany. So even though we don't yet have skeletons from the exact time period of the last common ancestor, six or seven million years ago, we have these other two skeletons, four and a half and 11 and a half million years old, that are sort of bookends for what the common ancestor may have looked like. They're bookends to the story, but not necessarily the story itself. Now, eventually we will have this story. We will have these fossils because every year we find more and more and more of these things. But for now, can we still learn something from these bookends? I think so. These skeletons suggest to me that the common ancestor of humans and the African apes may not have been a knuckle walker at all, but an ape moving on two legs in the trees, something orangutans, gibbons, and spider monkeys sometimes do. If that turns out to be the case, then we no longer have to come up with an explanation for why bipedalism evolved from knuckle walking, because it didn't. It wasn't a new locomotion at all, just an old one in a new setting. As my colleague Carol Ward has said, asking why humans stood up from all fours is the wrong question. Perhaps we should instead be asking why our ancestors never dropped down on all fours in the first place. But it would be foolish to think we have this figured out. There is so much more waiting to be discovered, more fossils yet to be found, and much of the human story yet to be written. But it's still a wonder we are here. We humans are pathetically slow. Even the fastest human to have ever lived, Usain Bolt, maxed out at 28 miles an hour during his world record setting 100 meter dash in 2009. That's half the speed of a typical galloping quadruped of our size. He couldn't catch an antelope or flee from a lion. In fact, two leopard fang holes in the back of the head of an ancient human fossil discovered in a South African cave are a gruesome reminder that there were evolutionary consequences for our lack of speed. Furthermore, the short squat pelvis that biomechanically adapts humans for efficient bipedal travel also forces a baby to corkscrew through the birth canal during delivery, making many childbirths difficult and sometimes dangerous. We are also unstable on our two legs. We fall a lot. Now, when's the last time you saw a squirrel, cow, cat, dog trip and just fall? Now, I'm making light of this, but 30,000 Americans and half a million people worldwide die from falls each year. And as we age, bipedalism takes its painful toll on our backs, knees, and feet. Bipedalism not only leaves us vulnerable to leg and foot injuries, but it makes us particularly feeble when they happen. Okay, the advantages of bipedal locomotion obviously outweigh the costs. Otherwise, we would have gone extinct long ago. But given the many downsides to upright walking and how rare this form of locomotion is in the animal world, I've wondered as a scientist, what tipped the scales towards survival rather than extinction? And the answer, it turns out, may be found with one of the most wonderful and mysterious aspects of the human condition. It's rumored that an anthropology student once asked Margaret Mead for the earliest evidence of human civilization. And after a brief reflection, Mead responded, a healed femur. While this exchange is likely apocryphal, the point remains. So I wonder then what Professor Mead would have thought of this fossil. It's a two million year old hominin femur with a healed fracture. Or this one, another two million year old fossil from Kenya. This time it's a shin bone preserving evidence for an ankle fracture. Again, a healed one or this fossil, an even older three and a half million year old partial skeleton discovered in Ethiopia by Johannes Haile Selassie. 
It's from Lucy's species, a large male, we think. He too broke his ankle as a child, but it healed and he lived into adulthood. Think about this. Long before hospitals and doctors, long before fire or shelter, are already slow and unstable ancestors living on a dangerous landscape littered with large carnivores were occasionally breaking bones and surviving? To me, this means only one thing. They were assisting one another. We've had each other's backs for a long, long time. Bombarded in our 24-hour news cycle with examples of human cruelty, we often overlook how remarkably cooperative and tolerant we can be. Helping one another comes naturally to us. Holding a door open for a neighbor, donating spare change, passing a plate to share food with others. These are such everyday occurrences that human kindness, like walking, has become pedestrian. It could be then that one of the most mysterious aspects of the human condition, our capacity for selflessness, arose out of our vulnerabilities as bipeds in a dangerous world. These behavioral changes that accompany the evolution of walking are not just important for those who can, who can walk, but also for those who cannot. As descendants of bipedal hominins, our evolutionary journey continues because empathy, cooperation, and generosity evolved in lockstep with our distinctive form of locomotion. After millions of years and dozens of evolutionary experiments, we humans are the last bipedal ape on Earth. And as we stride forward as a species into uncertain and unsettling times, it helps to glance back over our shoulder at the trail we've left. We've traveled far and overcome much together. So thank you um, for hearing the summary of, of the book. Uh, I'm looking forward to, to questions. I do wanna acknowledge all of the people that helped me over the years. Um, writing this book was only possible because of the incredible support and guidance I received from first and foremost, my amazing family, especially my wife, Erin, and my two awesome kids, Ben and Josie, shown here uh, at the Motshire Museum. And to my large extended family and friends, many of uh, whom uh, I saw in the chat, um, thank you. And I can't wait to hug you all again. Um, I've had amazing mentors, uh, Lucy Kirshner at the Boston Museum of Science and Laura McClatchy, my PhD advisor, uh, and incredible colleagues at the University of Michigan, Worcester State University, Boston University, and now at Dartmouth. I'm very grateful to my uh, agent, Esmond Harmsworth at Avitas, and my amazing editor, Gail Winston, and the entire team at HarperCollins. Um, and I'm grateful to my other editor, um, my dad, who poured over these pages and helped me find my voice to write this book. I'm constantly uh, impressed, energized, and inspired by my amazing students. Um, there are too many of them to name. Um, thanks to Kate, Ellie, Luke, Angie, Eve, and many others through the years who've kept me on my toes. Um, and I'm particularly grateful to Alex Claxton. Uh, Alex um, was the fact checker for this book and did an amazing job. And it was really fun to go through these pages with him. Uh, thank you to Alex, uh, Alexis Seabrook. Alexis Seabrook was our illustrator extraordinaire who created the awesome uh, family tree image that's uh, right in the inside uh, cover of the book and appeared a couple uh, times in, in my talk. Um, and I also have listed here a number of the, uh, the funding agencies through the years that have supported my research uh, that is, that is uh, mentioned at times uh, throughout the book. Uh, so thank you all very much. Hey, Jerry, I'm just going to grab my video on here in just a second. And it looks like we are both on screen uh, together right now. And that was really inspiring. And uh, what a joy to hear you talk so eloquently about evolution, as well as like the just sort of the joys and the perils of walking. Uh, we've gotten some great questions already in the chat, and I'm going to uh, keep scanning those. One of the um, sort of two interrelated ones you know, that, that I would say, First question, um, where do you do your research to find these bones? So we know that you mm -hmm. specialize specifically in the foot, right, and the ankle. Like what, where, where is your primary research? Mm -hmm. So there are a couple of places. There are sites in Eastern Africa. Uh, Tanzania is where I've gone um, most recently at a site called Liatoli. And Liatoli is this amazing site because it preserves not only, not only fossils, um, 
uh, here I can grab some some fossils here from the site of Laetoli. Here we go. All right. So here's a fossil from the site of Laetoli, uh, this beautiful jaw. Uh, it's a little over 3 million years old, um, but also fossil footprints. And so here's a, um, this is a sneak preview of a footprint that we haven't published yet uh, that is going to be hopefully announced soon. Um, it's an amazing uh, footprint uh, from the site of, of Laetoli. Uh, so that's in Tanzania. That's an open air site, um, uh, which means it was an ancient lakeshore environment, rivers flowing into it. Animals would occasionally die on the lakeshore, and then their bones would become fossilized out of the silt and the sand and the volcanic ash uh, that was erupting in that, in that tectonically active area of the Great Rift Valley. Okay, now go to South Africa. And it's a completely different kind of place. In South Africa, there are caves. And the landscape is um, limestone. And it's turning into, it's just turned into Swiss cheese over the last few millions of years. And as animals on the, in, on the, on the, on the uh, landscape would die, their bones would get washed down into these caves. And then the limestone would mix in, would drip down and mix in with the soil and the bones and fossilize them. And so it's a very different environment in South Africa where we find um, some, some really, really fun fossils. For instance, this one is from a South African cave called Sterkfontein, and it's about a 2 million year old skull of an Australopithecus. So very different kinds of environments where we find these fossils. And so we search for them in different ways. In South Africa, there are these blocks of rock that end up being pulled from the cave and they can be CT scanned and examined that way. And in Eastern African sites, um, we spend a lot of time just slowly inching, inch by inch, millimeter by millimeter, walking and staring at the ground, trying to find a tiny little fragment of bone that we can then follow up the hillside and, and, and hope to find its source. Um. Just giving you a heads up, we've gotten such a like overwhelming response of questions. I'm going to try to keep this in some type of logical flow. Uh, but we talked about like where you do this in terms of the primary research. But a really interesting question came up about museums and the role of storing fossils. Um, and the the question I'm going to get from Paul, which I think was uh, great. Do you think it's possible that the fossils you are looking for might already exist in a drawer? In a museum storage area, <laughs> sort of like Raiders of the Lost Ark, right? It's it's in a it's in a big uh, um, you know container somewhere. Um, okay, um, I, I I don't think so. Um, however, there are so many fossils um, that that we discover, um, and then they end up on, like you said, they end up being curated into museum collections. And it can take a while to get around to actually describing them. And I was amazed as a graduate student when I first traveled to some of these museums and um, I asked to see the fossils that researchers had published on and were part of the record. Um, and then as I was going through the material, I would bump into a fossil and say, well, what's this one? This one, I, I don't know about this one. And it just hadn't been described yet. And um, you know, a few questions later, and, uh, and I'm describing it, right? So there are all these opportunities for graduate students. You know, a lot of times researchers um, come into this field thinking that, um, well, A, that we already sort of have this all figured out, and we don't, and B, that we already have properly described all the fossils that have come out of the ground, and we have it. Um, there's, a, there's, a, there's a backlog. Um, and then what I always tell students is that fresh eyes on fossils um, you see things that other researchers before you have not seen. So don't assume, again, that we already head to toe have figured out Lucy, for instance. Every time a new student uh, sets their eyes on Lucy, they're going to see something that someone hasn't spotted before. Um, it, 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 it's, it's pretty arrogant to think that, you know, we've already, <laughs> we've already figured it all out. Um, so always go back and always revisit those old fossils with new techniques, new technology, and, and a fresh set of eyes and, and new questions. So that's really because I've had the honor of being in your laboratory before and being wowed by the type of technologies that you're using right now. And we've had a discussion about how technology and distance and even in the pandemic things have to, had to radically shift or change do you could you tell us a little bit about what these technologies are that you're utilizing to 
study these fossils as well as how you date them? Like how, what, oh, sure. how do we know a bone is old right now? Oh, that's a great question. So I'll start with that one. Um, Again, it depends on the fossil site, but um, if we're sticking with Eastern Africa, Lucy, for instance, everyone or most folks know know about the famous Lucy skeleton. Who I, I have a replica of her right back here. So beautiful Lucy. Um, Lucy is 3.18 million years old. Um, now, how do we know that? Okay, we you know we didn't find a wallet in her back pocket or something like that. Instead, her bones are wedged between layers of volcanic ash, and volcanic ash has radioactive material in it, say radioactive potassium that decays into argon at a known rate. It's almost like when you crack open a soda um, or, or crack open a beer and, and you pour it really fast, you're gonna get a whole lot of foam. And then slowly that foam decays or turns into the, the thing you wanna drink. Well, when a volcano erupts, it lays down in, its, in, 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 in the volcanic ash, there's radioactive potassium. That's sort of like your foam. And slowly it turns into argon. And so these little crystals can be collected that trap that argon. And so if you have a lot of argon, say, then that's been there for a long time. But if there's not much at all, if all you have is the radioactive potassium, then that volcano erupted uh, pretty recently and everything in between. So if you know that ratio and you know the rate at which this happened, then you can date the layers. And then as long as the fossil is found between those layers as Lucy was, then we can estimate her age. She was found quite close to a layer that's 3.2 million years old. And so uh, she's estimated to be about 3.18 million years old. But we're never going to have the precision. We're never going to say that Lucy died, you know, on April 6th, 3,182,212 years ago. That's just not possible. Um, but that's okay. Because what we're looking for are big patterns over time. Um, and Lucy at 3.18 million years uh, allows us to see what the body form of our ancestors, or at least some of them, looked like at that time. Because what we're realizing as we explore different sites throughout Africa uh, from two, three, four million years ago is that there were different kinds of upright walkers coexisting on the same landscape. So I love to you know, do the thought experiment with students that imagine you jump, jump in a time machine, go back in time, um, you would see different, different species of early human ancestors um, sharing a landscape, walking in slightly different ways, um, which has been a really fun thing to work on um, with some of my research for the last, for the last few years. So that's, that's the, the dating. Um, and then I've already forgotten the question that came before that. Oh, how, um, but what, what are some of the new technologies that you're using oh, yeah, in your course. lab to, to show, show and get fossils in your lab faster? Yeah, yeah, That's yeah. That's a so, leading question. Yeah. Sorry about that, Marcus. Yeah, no, great question. So, so we, you know, bones, bones don't always, um, uh, are not always linear, right? And, and, and a linear measurement is not always going to give us the, the kind of shape uh, or description of a shape. And so um, what we've been doing is, is 3D scanning a lot of these fossils. And from a 3D scan, uh, you can quantify much better areas and curvature. Uh, and some of my colleagues are doing some really wonderful work um, doing just that. Uh, but beyond that, one of the things that's happening is say in South Africa, there'll be a chunk of rock that has a fossil in it and they'll CT scan it. And then you can digitally extract the fossil and print it out with a 3D printer. And so you can start studying the fossil, a printout of the fossil, mm -hmm. even though the original fossil is still embedded within the rock. And so this is a, a method that's accelerating our ability to uh, analyze these fossils and potentially to, to, to keep them in their original context. Because every time you remove a fossil from its context, you're actually destroying information. But if you could keep it there and still extract the anatomy, then maybe future generations will have ways of analyzing that, that soil, that bone that we can't even dream of right now. So we, we have to think into the future of what um, sci scientists 100 years from now might look at what we're doing and cringe at, at you know, what they would perceive as crude techniques. Um, and so you know, one example, here, I'll, I'll go off camera for one sec. Yeah, sorry, more bones. 
Um, so this is a heel bone that was 3D laser scanned in South Africa because I can't travel to South Africa right now because of the pandemic. Um, but this bone was found in a cave and it was 3D laser scanned there. A file was sent to me and I printed it out with a 3D printer and now I can start working on the anatomy of, of this heel, this ancient heel from a 2 million year old ancestor of ours, even though the original is, is in South Africa and who knows when I'm gonna be able to go there and study it. Hmm. That's amazing. The technology is allowing you to continue to do that research, um, even though travel is very difficult right now. Uh, we have a, a number of questions along sort of the strands of like the perils of bipedalism um, hmm. at different ages. And you do feature this in your book where you have a chapter, you know, on baby steps and then birth and then from injury. And I'd just be curious if you could speak a little bit more about, um, you, you, you covered it so briefly, um, just taking our first steps as a child and that wonderful diagram of a toddler going all the way through a lab. Um, how much energy and effort does it take for us as humans to do this versus a quadrupedal animal? Yeah. So uh, it depends. There's massive variation in, in how um, baby animals take their first steps and develop. Think about um, a giraffe, for instance, where a giraffe is born or an elephant is born and they're taking their first steps day one. Um, they have to. Uh, if they didn't, um, they, they would be vulnerable to predation that very evening. Um, and they exist in a, in a herd environment. And so there are other members of the group that are going to protect it. And so there are some animals that what we, we would call, um, we, we would call uh, 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 precocial um, that are um, able to move right away uh, once they're born. And then there are animals like, like you know, black bears um, up here in, in Northern New England, where when they're born, they're about the size of your thumb. And they're born when their moms are still hibernating. Uh, and they, they'll crawl up and they'll nurse from their moms. But even still, right after birth, um, they, are, they are pretty helpless. Um, humans are interesting in that we are precocial, and eye, eyes open, and, and a baby can manipulate an entire room, right? Um, but it can't walk. It can't move yet on its own. It's pretty, it's um, uh, 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 unable to, to navigate on its own like seals can or, um, or elephants or, or giraffes. And what that promotes is social care, right? What that promotes are other individuals being there, taking care of, of the child, carrying them. And one of the most amazing things that I observed in, in Karen Adolph's lab at NYU, um, and she, she knows more about how kids learn to walk than, than, than anyone. Um, and they did this study where they had um, kids crawling on a, on a, a walkway, um, and then there was a giant gap there. And the kids would crawl on, kids would crawl on, and they just crawled right off. Right. They just they, they were fearless and they just went right off. Um, and there was a caretaker there to, to catch them. Thankfully, there was a spotter. Um, and but then they learned they, you know, they didn't like that. So they eventually learned uh, and they would crawl towards it and then they would stop um, and they'd peer over and they'd learn to crawl down and then get back up. OK, same kids now, a couple of months later, have learned how to walk on two legs and they go right back to falling off the cliff. They go right back to walking off the edge. And it was this amazing realization that A, um, we develop these abilities in a social context, that our kids um, are able to, to take these risks um, because there is uh, social support and that humans are, are pro-social animals and it affects our behavior, it affects how we develop and how our kids develop. Um, but the other thing that was amazing is that you know, I said to Karen, wow, they forgot everything. And she said, no, 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 no. They didn't forget everything. They are seeing the world from a new vantage point. That when we become bipedal, our kids suddenly see the world differently. Um, and, and that to me was this really wonderful uh, moment of realization of that, that you know, bipedalism just kind of opens these horizons to our kids. Um, it frees the hands, they carry more frequently. Um, and, and off they go, right? But I'm, I'm curious, like in your research and in thinking about locomotion in general, have you come across anything else that that is not necessarily a bipedal animal that shares that same type of social structure? I, I'm thinking um, 
of like dolphins, you know, when they're learning to swim or, um, so, so it's not just humans, right. That, that have yeah. these social interactions and in, in locomotion, right. It's, it's no, 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 it's not, it's not. And, and it's certainly not humans that, I mean, at the very end, I was talking about care and compassion and empathy mm -hmm. and, and, and pro-sociality. Um, and, you know, I mean, the, the animals that work the best together, are ants and bees, right. So we, we see, uh, cooperative, um, uh, behaviors, uh, in non-humans all the time. You see it in, in dogs, cooperation uh, in dogs, and you see it in one of our close living relatives, and that's the bonobo. So very often mm. when we're contrasting human locomotion, human anatomy, and human behavior with our ape relatives, we think about chimpanzees. And that's fair. That's fine. They are very closely related to us. But equally related to us is another ape that lives in Central Africa, lives south of the Congo River. Um, chimpanzees live north of the Congo River, so they never interact with each other. And it's called a bonobo. And bonobos are very tolerant of one another. Um, they are um, uh, uh, highly social. When they come across, if a bonobo troop comes across another group of bonobos in the forest, um, they'll groom and share food. Um, they'll have sex with each other. Uh, chimpanzees, if they come across another chimpanzee group, it is not like that at all. They're incredibly territorial, um, and they could, they, they, there have been observations of coalitionary warfare happening, of chimpanzees killing other chimpanzees. Um, mm -hmm. And so we do see in the animal world um, this, this cooperation and, and, and cooperation around children. There was a study that came out just a couple of weeks ago of bonobos in the wild adopting uh, unrelated bonobos from another group. Uh, infants from another group um, into their troop. And again, chimpanzees phew, never would happen. Uh, but we see that in humans. Now, sort of fast forwarding to another stage of life and bipedalism, you have a whole chapter on birth and how that is very difficult um, for us as upright workers. I wonder if you can explain or talk a little bit about like maybe that bonobo versus a human and mm. like, are, are there major differences in giving birth um, and the challenges of that. Yeah, there, there are. Um, so Marcos, I'm glad you mentioned that. And, and you know, I've got props, right? So I work at a science museum, <laughs> you, you always have props. So this <laughs> is a, right. a, a chimpanzee pelvis and this is a chimpanzee newborn. Um, and so what is birth like for a chimpanzee? Okay, and, and, and you know, maybe it's not this easy, but um, the head just, goes right through with, without any difficulty at all. Chimpanzee births are, are fast. Um, they're not in labor for very long. Um, and, and, and chimpanzees typically give birth at night. So there's a lot we don't know about chimpanzee birth, uh, but in captivity, uh, their, their birth um, is, is, does not appear to have the difficulty that, that happens in humans. Okay, here's a human female pelvis. And this is a newborn human skull, uh, plastic um, replica. And uh, if a baby is going to be born uh, the way a chimpanzee baby would be born, which is facing forward you, most of the time, uh, coming through this way, it can't. It gets stuck, right? So what happens is the head turns. So there's rotation that occurs. And then baby gets stuck again at the midplane. And that's where what are called ischial spines come in and, um, and, and, and uh, narrow the midplane. So the baby keeps rotating. There's a corkscrew uh, happening here. And then eventually the baby is born. But notice what's happened is that the head is now facing, the face, I'm sorry, is now facing the back. Um, and the back of the head is facing the front. So this is what's called an occiput anterior birth. And this is how most humans who are born vaginally um, are born is occiput anterior. So you're facing backwards. Okay. Now the head is facing backwards. If the mom reached down to assist with her own birth, she'd put pressure on the, on the baby's neck. Now chimpanzees do this because their babies are born and their faces are looking right at them and they can reach down and assist with their own birth, um, with, their, with their own baby's birth. Um, but in humans, we rarely, rarely give birth alone there's usually a helper. Cross-culturally, um, there are typically female helpers, midwives, who assist with, with birth. And one of the arguments that's been made by my colleagues, Wendy Trevathan and Karen Rosenberg, is that it's because of this rotation. 
and that rotational birth um, it, it, it coincides or it is paired with um, a social birth and that you have other members there assisting you. Okay, here's Lucy's pelvis, okay? Now imagine she gives birth to a baby about the size of a chimpanzee baby. And I think it's bigger, but let's just, for the sake of argument, say it's a chimp, okay? Chimp doesn't fit. It's just like us. You have to rotate. And so this rotational birth, which happens because of the shape of the pelvis and the shape of the pelvis is adapted for upright walking. So this brings us back to what does this have to do with upright walking? Well, the changes to the pelvis that, that happened in our early ancestors changed birth and introduced now a rotational birth. Um, and the outcome from that birth would be um, w w is likely to be the best outcome, a surviving child, a surviving mom um, with helpers present. So again, this comes back to this connection between bipedalism and us as social animals helping each other out um, in circumstances, not only in birth, but after birth uh, and, and helping raise the kid. When a chimpanzee has a baby, the mom uh, uh, stays with it for about four months without any other chimpanzee coming near it. Um, sometimes it's six months. Um, the earliest that's been observed is four months. In humans, you have a newborn and everyone wants to see it, right? You bring it to the supermarket and you have people, strangers, sticking their face in, you, in your carriage, right? Trying to touch your kid. And everyone seems to be attracted to, to, to babies. Um, and again, I, I think this is connected to us being... Uh, uh, this, this hyper social primate. Um, and, and that's connected and deeply rooted uh, into our past as, as, as bipedal animals. Um, we had a question in the chat about reverence and bones. And I, I'm thinking more now in terms of death and you know burial sites and, and containing bones. Uh, you've, I think, found a lot of really interesting bones in these types of sites. Um, why? Why do you think people have such reverence or why humans have reverence to bones? And I often think mm -hmm. about this with skulls in many cultures, right? Skulls are kept or utilized for ritual objects or ritual implements. Do, do you see that with feet and with your speciality? Like, do you see that like, like those items being thought of as reverent? I think you think of them as reverent because uh, you're, you're very excited by them. What, but uh, let me think a or, or discuss a little bit about why, why bones are so important to us. So, you know, I, I, I write in the book um, about how when I sit with a fossil for the first time, um, I, I put my calipers away, I, I put my notebook away, and I just sit with the fossil for a while. Um, because these are the remains of, of my ancestors. These are, these are the remains of of, of, you know, extinct relatives of mine that, you know, these are things that were, as I said at the beginning, these, these were living creatures a lot like me that lived and breathed and laughed and cried and ate and had families and had kids. And, and so, you know, to me, I, I, am, I am deeply connected to these fossils. Now, as a scientist, I find them wildly fascinating their shapes and how they can you know connect to one another in terms of relatedness and the questions they can answer mm -hmm. um but as a scientist um who, who who's also a human and, and who isn't right <laughs> all the scientists are um we also we're, we're emotional primates and we shouldn't be afraid of the the subjectivity that 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 might come from being personally connected to these objects that we study, because these these aren't just inert objects; these are the remains of of you know things a lot like us that tell us. To me, again, the the key is that they tell us something about us and how we got to be the way we are, and 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 why we we are this way. Um, and so, yeah, I, I'm fascinated by bones. Bones to me tell stories. And, and every bone, you know, when, I, when I'm working on a fossil, um, I, I take it as a personal challenge to squeeze every single bit of information that I can out of a, out of a tiny little fossil. Um, 
you know, the, the, a tiny little thing like this, surviving the ground for 2 million years. And here I get to hold it in my hand and, and I have the privilege of studying this thing. I owe it to this ancient creature mm -hmm. to squeeze all this information out of it and then, and then share those stories and tell those stories the best I can. Um, knowing that future generations might revisit this work and say, hey, wait a minute, he got that wrong, or ah, there's even more that we can squeeze out of this. Um, so, so yeah, I think there is a deep connection that we have to, 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 to bones. Um, and may, maybe it's that. And I think for everyone, it might be a little, it might be, you know, personal. Not, not, not everyone is going to have a room full of bones like I do. <laughs> No, uh, a couple of questions came in about your process of writing. Now that we we are, are here at the author talk with the Norwich Bookstore and the Monshire Museum of Science, uh, so I'm curious about how you put together this book and the the way that this particular work came out. It's, it's so enjoyable and so mm. just very readable. Um, and you know, and I will say I was inspired, and I did tell the entire staff of the Monshire because of the story of Petals the um, the bear that like the first chapter alone, or even the introduction, gives you about 60 things you need to YouTube to watch um, <laughs> funny walking things. So. So there's a great sense of humor throughout the book, a, a great warmth and empathy towards um, the reverence of our ancestors and, and how you know studying them can help us to think about ourselves out into the future. How, how did you put this book together? It's, it's, it's so warm and inviting. It, it reminds me of talking to you in person. <laughs> that, that's a really nice compliment. Thank, I appreciate that, Marcos. Um, yeah, so um, I mean, I've been studying this for the last, for the last 15 years, um, but before that, I was an educator at a science museum, and I loved talking to visitors about, about science and about um, human biology. And eventually, when I discovered paleoanthropology, that's all I could think about and all I wanted to talk to people about with these, with these old bones and the stories they told. Um, and, and so I wanted to find that voice again. I didn't want to write this book for my colleagues. Um, I wanted this voice, uh, this, I wanted this book to be for people who don't think about human evolution every day, like I do and like, and like my colleagues do. Um, and so what it took was some organization first um, and, and some folks at Dartmouth, uh, Adam Nemiroff, Mike Godsward, uh, helped me put together a massive open online course, a MOOC on the, the, uh, the science of bipedalism, the science of upright walking. And so that came out, I believe, in 2017, um, a massive open online course on, on walking. And, and for anyone listening, you can, you can still, you can still um, you know, attend that course. Um, it's, it's open uh, and remains open. And that helps so much with my organization of what is the story? Um, and then uh, when, I, when I paired up with, with my agent, uh, Esmond, and, and my editor, Gail, um, it was it was then about you know telling that story and 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 and, and writing it down and honestly I struggled with the I don't struggle with writing I was able to write 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 like I gotta throw it all on paper, um, but it I hadn't found my voice yet, and that that museum educator voice um, and and that's you know I, I thank my dad at the beginning because he was enormously uh, influential in reading through my my writing and saying ah here it is here's your voice you found it and then the next paragraph would be. Nope, you're back in scientist speak. Um, too jargony. Get rid of that. This is where you want to be. And eventually, I was able to find that voice. Um, and I, I loved writing this book. It was just an, an absolute pleasure. And I can't wait to, to write my next one. What do you think that bridge is between um, sort of specialist to public communicator. Um, I think that that's, you know, one of the hardest things right now is how do we communicate science publicly so that people really are receptive to listening. Um, how do you find that that in your writing, I mean, you it is very clear to me when you're articulating and you're speaking. Um, and I have definitely seen you do a, a demonstration or two or presentations or in even conversations. But how did you translate that into your writing, your, your voice? How did how did I do it? Mm -hmm. um, I, I I think again I, I I tried to recall what was happening when I was an educator at the museum, um, and tried to think again about you know if I was explaining this to, um, you know my uh, um, I, I often think about if I was explaining this to my aunt Jenny, um, if we were at Christmas and you know we're around the Jello mold and we start you know making plates of Jello and I start talking about it to my aunt Jenny she's a uh, an English teacher, um, 
And uh, so, you know, read a lot, writes a lot, um, but she would not hesitate to, to, to tell me if what I was saying made no sense or was completely boring. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, I, I had these people in mind that I was writing for, um, you know, family members, for, for friends um, who would be interested in this stuff, um, but, but maybe hadn't really thought about human evolution, you know, since Lucy was discovered. Um, you know, what have we found since then? And it turns out we found a ton of stuff since then. I mean, we've doubled the human fossil record since Lucy. And um, the story is so much more interesting and so much more complex um, uh, uh, since, since, since that, you know, that time in the 70s and, and, and the 80s. And so I really wanted to, to tell that story of these discoveries. And then, and then the people involved, so many of my colleagues are amazing and they do incredible work and they ask such cool questions and they're good people. And I wanted to, to introduce them to, the, to, the, to a general audience and say, look, you know, here's Kara Wall Scheffler studying um, the, the, the energetic uh, effects of carrying. Um, and that, you know, women with wider hips actually use less energy when they're, when they're carrying. Um, and, and you think about that in the context of, of, of you know, carrying infants. Um, you know, Anna Warner, um, who did this amazing work showing that, um, you know, those wide hips that women have, which many people have, are, have thought, uh, come at some, some cost, some energetic cost that women must not be as good at walking as men. Well, it's nonsense. They walk just as efficiently, just as energetically efficiently. Those hypotheses were generated uh, decades ago by men. So as they're being mm. tested by a new generation of researchers, uh, we're, finding, we're finding different different things. We're not just assuming things anymore. Uh, we're, we're testing those things with, with science. So I, I wanted to tell those stories, those, the amazing work that my colleagues um, were doing. Mm. Well, we're so uh, so lucky to have this book, and so lucky that this will hopefully inspire other folks to continue studying. Um, your pa paleoanthropology did not end with Lucy, right? That it that it is still a very live field. Um, this time, I want to bring um, Liza back on, um, if that is okay, um, and make sure she is spotlight. Yes, I, I can see her up on my screen as well. Um, to thank you know the Norwich Bookstore, and again all the folks at the the Montshire. I know. The book um, is prevalent in Norwich. You might find it at the Montshire Museum store and the Norwich Book Store because we're big fans of it. Liza, anything um, that you'd like to say? Well, I just wanted to thank Jerry for his um, fascinating talk. But I also wanted to thank the, the audience for their amazing, thought, amazingly thoughtful questions. Um, my mind is just with all the questions and all the, all the um, points of view. And... Um, I also wanted to say that the books are available. This is definitely a Norwich production. Um, the, the, <laughs> and uh, we actually have signed books too, which I assume you guys do also. So there are signed books yep. available. It makes it even more special by Norwich. And um, it was great to collaborate with the Montshire Museum. The Norwich Bookstore and the Montshire are obviously neighbors. And um, let's do it again. All right. And be sure, just as Jerry said, to support your local museum in these times, support your local bookstores yes. as well, yes. and definitely order locally uh, <laughs> so that you can uh, make sure to help support and keep these community treasures uh, together. Jerry, thank you so much. And for your kind words earlier uh, as well, um, you are a true tre treasure of the community as well. I just want people to know on this recording, people are asking this question, is this going to be uh, available? Yes, it will be available on the Montshire website and the Norwich Bookstore website on CATV, um, the best of the Upper Valley, and we'll try to get this information out as widely as possible. Jerry DeSilva was the first person in our local community to come and visit me as a science museum director and say, hey, I used to do museums too. Um, and I'm just as jazzed about museums. And in fact, I think I took that photo of um, Josie and You did. Ben. You did. Yep. <laughs> so uh, that's right. You could, uh, uh, giving me two uh, more perfect models who totally know how to look at bones. Uh, uh, through, through a glass case. So um, it's been a pleasure knowing you here and I'm sure we will all collaborate out into the future. Um, so from the Montreal, I wanna thank you so much um, for the work that you do. And again, for our, our local bookstore, uh, the Norwich Bookstore as well. Liza, any, any last words? No, that's great. Thank you, thank you. Thanks right. to everyone. Thank you, that's, thank you. I think that's gonna be it for today. Thank you so much and uh, we'll, we'll see you soon.